would like to welcome Travis Rivers to the Haydash Prairie Video Oral History Project. Welcome, Travis. My name is Rebecca Nichols, and I'll be moderating this uh, interview. Um, we're so pleased to have you here uh, today. Um, we are doing a piece on the Oracle. Uh, we would love to know more about you, um, and uh, even to, to take it further and find out what you're doing now, what you hope the future would be. But at the moment, I'd like to learn a little bit about you, Travis. Where were you born? Texas, Austin. And your parents? Also. What are your parents' names? Kenny Elizabeth and Lauren Travis Rivers. Do you have any brothers and sisters? David, James. And uh, do you have uh, um, any any children? Yes, Lauren Travis Rivers. Lauren Travis, great. <laughs> um, uh, I know that you are a writer and a publisher and uh, manager, and um, I'd like to know a little bit more about where you got interested in maybe um, managing or writing or any of the things. I would love to get on this tape to get to know you a little bit better. Well, I was writing poetry when I was a kid, and um, um, I... Um, went to the University of Texas. I recorded some Texas um, uh, blues artists as part of their folk library. Um, I became, um, uh, I like to jokingly say, uh, I left Texas to not further embarrass my grandparents. <laughs> um, the, um, it was a time that was full of hope in the early 60s, uh, dashed, um, an entire generation dashed uh, with the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Um, the entire country went through a year or so of deep depression, um, and um, it uh, affected me a great deal. Um, I spent uh, probably an entire year drunk. And um, one day, I was walking down the street in Austin, and a newspaper flew down the street and wrapped around my leg, and I could not kick it off. So I reached down and picked it up, and it was a full-page ad for a movie called Help. So I said, well, I could certainly use that. So I went to the flick. I sat through it three times. I saw almost everyone I knew that afternoon come into that theater. Um, it was, uh, Austin used to be on a circuit of not nationally released films where you fill up a little card at the end of it. And um, halfway through the third sitting, um, I realized that I, what I thought was there was there, that you didn't have to the world was yours to change. You could do anything you wished. So I went home, I painted a sign, put it up in my front yard that said, headed west, yard sale. And I sold everything I had. I bought a, um, an old TR-10, which was an uh, English touring car. There were only a few hundred of them in the United States for 40 bucks. And uh, I drove to Austin. I drove to San Francisco. It cost eighteen dollars to get here. About what year is this? Oh, um, sixty-five. <coughs> um, and um, at that same time, I think Janice came back to Texas. Um, I um, lived in Berkeley for a while. Uh, I heard that uh, Margaret Mead's house was open in uh, Big Sur. So I wrote him a note, and I, she said that I could stay there. So I went down to Big Sur, and when I got there, there was a um, um, family with three kids living in the house. I wasn't going to kick them out. Um, I um, asked around, and the only place anyone knew that uh, you might be that was empty was owned by the witch, Amelia Newell. <laughs> You don't want to see her, but 
So I went to see her when she was quite normal. And, um, and she let me have a cabin she had on the west side of Highway 1. And I spent about a year there. Um, there were lots of interesting folks living in the rocks and hills around near Gorda, the town, little town called Gorda. And um, Rodigan had just left. He had been, uh, he'd written uh, Trout Fishing in America in the next property over. And um, I, uh, one day I woke up and said, you know, I've been out here long enough. I think I'll go back to town. So I came up to San Francisco and I went over to see my friend Mo, uh, Mo's books. And, where, uh, where was Mo's books? In Berkeley. Okay. When I, I was in, I, part of what I did at the University of Texas is I, uh, I had a bookstore um, called Travis Books, go figure. And um, we sell the antiquarian books, Texiana and Americana, and um, lefty stuff, comic books. Um, and one of the things that happened when I first got here um, was I uh, needed to have some more money. Uh, so I took some of my books and I went around to the store, Shakespeare, Black Oak, etc. And they offered me 10 cents a pound. Well, I wasn't going to sell the first edition of Aldous Huxley's Chrome Yellow for 10 cents a pound. Um, but when Mo saw it, he offered me 600 bucks. So I knew I liked Mo. Mm. And over the fullness of time, I, I became kind of, I adopted him as my dad, locally. Um, so I walked in and he says, so, I, God, I'm so glad to see you. I don't have time here. Go, go see this place and come back and tell me about it. Well, I mean, you know, I'm on foot. This address is in a place I have never heard of called Haight-Ashbury. Mm -hmm. And um, so I figure out how to get there on the bus from Berkeley. And I come to Haight Street. It's all boarded up. Ron and Jay Thalen have the psychedelic shop. Um, that's about it. On the whole street. Uh, there's a bowling alley. There's a movie theater. Uh, there was uh, the haberdashery, which is where the drugstore eventually was. On the was. Sonic. And yeah. And there was a jeweler across the street, very grumpy guy. And um, I liked the ladies at the haberdashery. And um, so I went to the address, and it was the old Woolworths on Hay Street. Um, Do you remember the address? Well, it was a, no, 17-something. Right. But it's... If you look in the early oracles, that was their office. Okay. Um, and then I went back, and Mo said, uh, so what did you think? I said, God, it's a beautiful store. It looks like an old world for us. He said, it is. I said, I said, why did you send me over there? He said, I think you, I'm going to open a bookstore. I said, why? The place is boarded up. He said, well, they're students. I said, no, they're not. He said, well, yeah, there's San Francisco State, which is like three miles away. And uh, San Francisco Community College, up on the hill, and I, um, or at least San Francisco College, whatever it's called. Sure. Um, and I said, well, you know, it's not, it's like you're two blocks from Sather Gate. I mean, these, they're students, they're not going to come to the store. He said, I already bought the building, it'd be a beautiful bookstore. Now, why did you send me? He said, I want you to run it. So, we went about um, looking into that. It would take about 60 days to get a permit. You had to have a rag dealer's permit. You had to have a second-hand dealer's permit to sell used books in San Francisco. So I said to Mo that maybe I should go to Texas for a few days. And um, because you could still borrow cars then, I borrowed a car. And um, I heard that um, Big Brother was auditioning singers. So I went over to see Chet, who we've known each other since we were kids, and uh, in Texas. And uh, I said, hey, I'm going to go, and I'll, are you really thinking about having a girl singer in the band now? Because at one point I'd suggested that they get a girl that we knew in common, Janice, to come. And he said, we don't want no girl singers in the band. I'm like, oh, okay. 
And he said, yeah. I said, well, I'll check on her. I know she's doing better. And um, so I went back to Austin to see my family. Janice decided that she wanted to come out here, so we drove back out. She auditioned. Two weeks later, she got a 30-minute standing ovation with the Avalon Ballroom. I, we went before the council, uh, the board of permits, and the curmudgeon <laughs> that uh, had the jewelry store objected to Morris Moskowitz getting a used dealer's license for Hate Street because the next thing you know, you'll be selling rags there. Well, that was, <coughs> that was shocking and upsetting to me. Um, so, Svee Strock had opened a little bead shop. Uh, a couple of other people, Amy, a girl named Amy Madigan or something like that, had opened a little store. Things were beginning to bubble a little bit. And, what uh, year are we talking about? It's still late 65. Um, and um, I had this brilliant idea. We'll put together, I went to talk to Ron and Jay about it. And they loved it. We had put together an argument. We couldn't get into the Haight Ashbury Merchants Association, an association that their grandparents had actually started because of this guy at the jewelry store. Um, so we started the Haight Ashbury Independent Proprietors. And we put little signs in people's windows by hip. And um, I, you know, built some permit, and they all went down for the second hearing, and lots of people were there supporting those. But we were still denied a permit. We couldn't then have a permit to have a used bookstore there for a year. We couldn't go back for a year. We get one appeal. So we couldn't open a used store. We decided we'd open a new store. So we start opened the print mint. By now, the word had spread through the upper echelons of the social water in San Francisco. And we had lines of limos out front where grandmas were coming down from the hill to buy posters for all their grandchildren in college. We did more business the first month in business than the original print men had done its first year. In six months, we had outstripped five years of their income. Wow. Um, and um, where were the posters coming from? The, the, oh, these were art prints, were you producing photographs. Them there? Um, no, we, they, there, there they was a there was a burgeoning um, uh, poster business um, out of New York, basically. Uh, lots of people were going in and getting the rights to some of the great photo libraries and and pulling interesting shots out. Um, Guys like Jim Marshall, for instance, the photographer, uh, did one of my more favorite posters of, um, of the, uh, uh, Joni and, and her sister. Um, Girls Say Yes to Boys Who Say No. That's a wonderful poster. And, um, but, um, so these things, you Maybe know. Yeah. Um, and so we... It, it became, it was a fad, uh, but it, it became widespread because these posters were often uh, graphically arresting, and so one kid would see them and, where did you get that? Exactly. From? And so anyway. Um, so your market didn't have to be from the people who lived around the corner, people were coming from all over. Well, and the, the, these women that, were, that lived up in Pacific Heights who were... Um, uh, very well off, and you know, had lots of grandkids. Um, uh, they were in their rooms, in their daughters' and sons' rooms in college, and that, of course, I assume adds some panache to the stuff. Um, at any rate, um, Ron and Jay. Um, <clears throat> put out a little paper called The Psychedelic Oracle of San Francisco. They did about 5,000 pages. It looked like, a, a, to my eye anyway, it looked like a National Enquirer for long hairs. 
Um, and um, at this time, I'd already been approached by two groups of folks to start a newspaper. Um, I'm a very busy boy. Um, and, and both of them basically had the same sort of Berkeley Bar kind of National Enquirer sure. thoughts about East Village Other Look, which I wasn't interested in doing it at all. And um, so Ron came and asked me what I would do if I were going to do a newspaper because he had just done this one. So I said, well, I mean, I like the name Oracle. Um, it would be interesting to do something that would have the voice of the people in it, as opposed to the voice of um, journalists. And um, so it, nothing happened. A few days later, he came back and he said, um, why don't you call a... Um, why don't we put up some papers and let's see if we can get some people to volunteer. So I called Mo and I said, Mo, you know, the guys across the street, you remember Ron and Jay? He said, yeah. He said, I, I, I'm, um, we can't use the entire back of the building um, because we can't put the bookstore in there. So maybe I could call a meeting back there and we could see if there's some interest in doing this newspaper. He said, sure. So we had a meeting. And literally. Do you know who was at that meeting? Well, Ron, uh, Jay, Steve Levine, um, Alan, uh, Lynn Farrar. I think maybe Lee Brew was there. Um, so at one point I said, so anybody interested in doing this? And a bunch of people raised their hand. They said, well, let's be here tomorrow. And Ron <coughs> then left and came back with one of those, so um, I remember that there was a time when fire extinguishers in inexpensive apartments were a red can that said fire on the side and it had sand in it. <laughs> he brought back a fire bucket and it was full of little pieces of paper, postcards, and quarters, mm -hmm. hundreds of them. And these were folks who had asked for a subscription. <laughs> so, and the assets from the first sale. So we put that in the bank, and um, um, we um, did the human being issue. That was the first issue. Yeah, after that. Do which you know was, who did the cover? That was uh, that was uh, Bowen, uh, Bowen and, and Mouse. And Sally Mouse, yes. Yeah. Um, so at this point, first issue, you're you're a family of people. Uh, putting this on. Was it strictly business? Were you guys friends? You were young? I didn't know any of them before that. So this that was a new, a new meeting for right. these people. Mm -hmm. Who were, who were the name, what were the names of the people that were involved on, at this state of the game for this first issue to come out? Basically Yourself, the ones we just... That you just mentioned. Right. Okay, and then did everybody have a job to do? Uh, was there something? No, it was pretty loose. Um, absolutely no one wanted to do the money part of it. I mean, so, I mean, that's always the most thankless. Right. So, the creative end is a lot more rewarding. So, yeah. Uh, you know, it requires you to keep books and stuff. Right. So, I just did that. And, um, um, and I, you know, I just I gave the money to Ron. And then one day, Ron came over, and uh, uh, he had heard something. I was I was about to be canned from the print man, um, because there was this youngster. One of the things that I did was distribution was going to be a problem, so I saw all these kids who were showing up with no place to live, living in doorways and stuff. So I had this idea a few weeks before the first issue came out. And um, so I went around, when I got back from Howard Quinn's printing presses with the uh, uh, piles of newspapers, I went around all the doorways and I gave the kids, if they were willing to do it, 100 papers and told them that they would go out and sell these papers 
um, uh, they could keep the quarters or they could come back and um, uh, and buy more with I was one of those kids but I wasn't in a doorway right I had a place to live That's right but the money from that bought our whole house dinner we figured we, <laughs> we figured we put about sixty thousand dollars in the pockets of the kids in Hay Street uh, one of my one of the kids was a kid named Dangerfield Ashton, who later became an artist with this operation. And um, uh, we, um, I think my most favorite moment was that there was one of the first kids I recruited to sell the paper. Um, on about the fifth issue, I saw him walking down the street. He had on shoes, he had on clean jeans, he had on a clean shirt. He was carrying two bags of groceries. You can only do that if you have an apartment and it, that meant he probably had a girlfriend as well. Right. So, <laughs> uh, you probably touched many more people than you realized. Well, I was, I was, yeah. I was moved by it. Um, the, at, a, at a certain point with the, with the Oracle, um, I remember Hermione, uh, we knew when to go and get the newspapers and others, so your distribution was starting to move. Mm -hmm. when, so how many issues were there totally of the Oracle? That's, there are at least 12. Okay. And from what year, to, uh, from when did it start and when? 66 to 68. And about how often did they come out? Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> um, that was a huge problem. Production. A production. Where were they getting printed? I did them all at Quinn's. And where did all the articles come from? And how did well, the, the big, the, big the really big stuff, I mean, you can't. Just fill an issue. I mean, some some people have to write something. So the really big stuff came from um, um, uh, large interviews taped and then transcribed. Um, the, probably the two most important ones were a conversation between um, Alan Watts, um, Ginsburg, and Leary about what's going on just after the BN, and that was a big seller. Uh, and then uh, it, we had this idea of doing 2000 AD in 1968, 32 years in the future. What do you think will be happening? We got the Esalen Institute involved, and um, so it was Watts and um, um, uh, oh, what's it? I'll think of some in a second. Um, Non-directive psychology. Etchner? No. He, he was one of the founders of the Essen with Fitzboro, but it's not Fitzboro. And um, um, and Herman Kahn. Mm -hmm. Herman Kahn created the um, um, the incredible fifties. Uh, you know, put put your head between your knees and kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> uh, he published a book in the late 50s called Thinking the Unthinkable, which chronicled and quantified an atomic holocaust, and what will it do? Um, and this brought about uh, the backyard um, uh, uh, bomb shelter craze. Um, he had just read the book called 2000 AD. It was a very, very um, dark and um, uh, sociopathic personality. Uh, he had uh, been an original hire at the uh, Hudson Institute, or no, at the Rand Institute, and then he started the Hudson Institute, both, both are arch conservative think tanks. And um, he, um, he was the only person we ever had to edit. He, um, um, this was, by the way, our last issue. Um, he, um, uh, In what way did you edit? Well, he, he had this unfortunate uh, tick. Whenever he said something socially reprehensible, he would go, <laughs> and we removed all the links. <laughs> um, because no one would believe that that was true, that he would actually do that on stage at the Longshoremen's Hall in front of three or 4,000 people, which is where it happened. And um, 
he suggested that uh, by this time, we, we were already doing experiments, meaning uh, the scientific community in South Africa, with the uh, pleasure zones of the brain and putting electrodes in and watching monkeys zap themselves into starvation. Um, later, that was they would let them have cocaine and get the same effect. You could you can also do that with a small sure. electrical impulses. Um, and um, uh, he suggested that social malcontents might want to just sit about in the park with a little photoelectric cell on their helmet and just be in oblivion. <laughs> and then he would go away going. Um, I, uh, that I thought was our best issue ever. You know, in, uh, in the community, uh, whether you realize it or not, the Oracle is considered a capsule. A capsule in time of a way of thinking, a way of looking at, at the news, a way of looking at expression in a different way. Um, who would you, who would you want to thank? If you could grab a net and say, well, this, we created this. Who in your world at that time would you want to thank? Who you think contributed, worked hard um, to have that unique creativity that would happen with the Oracle? Besides yourself, obviously, who do you think had the passion and and the motivation to keep this thing going? Uh, well, Len Farrar, um, Stephen Farrar. Levine. Len Len was uh, you know <coughs> did the day to day office. Um, there's a Photograph of uh, of three kids standing at Hate and Ashbury uh, that Gene Anthony did. That was a shot, yes. poster. That's me, Lynn, and the other girl is. Um, um, uh, that's why Lynn has her, the portfolio under the young lady has the portfolio under under her arm because Amazing. we're actually out doing some Very stuff. Very famous shot. It's in Gene Anthony's book Summer yeah. of Love. Yeah. And um, and the other girl lives up on the Arctic, uh, above the Arctic Circle. And has only been back once in 40 years. Wow, that's amazing. Well, I ask you a question. Uh, as you told the story about, you know, 2000, back in 1965, 66, if somebody was watching this video now, uh, 50 years from now, that we are filming here in 2005, and looking to the future, what would you hope? You're a very creative man, I can tell you make big things happen. Um, and from your own vision, where would you say um, people looking at these, this video, oral history project, as well as this tape, how in the future, somebody watching this tape, how, what, how would you see the future, 50, 100 years from now, people taking with whatever we did here and, and maybe being inspired by it in some way? How can you see and would you hope young people in the future? Well, every generation is um, has the same aspirations, every generation has the same questions, every generation has the same real problems. Uh, they have to make a living. Um, they have to live with their neighbors. Um, and you can only hope that folks continue to get along. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and remember, you didn't just look quietly. You stood up and took action. Well, it was a disturbing time. Um, just in closing, I get the, the the most the two most horrible things that I witnessed as a youngster was um, the the assassination of Kennedy. Um, Followed in a few months by uh, this youngster walking up to me, and um, I mean he was clearly a country boy, uh, and um, and I don't know what it was about me that made him ask me, um, but I was near the undergraduate library at the University of Texas, um, and uh, he wondered where Vietnam. Was. And I knew there was a, a big globe in the lobby, and so I took him there and I showed him. 
And he said, um, I said, it's here. He says, it's so small. And I said, yeah. I said, why? Why, why are you interested? And he says, because my brother was killed there last week. So I uh, said, well, you know, it looks like the Gulf of Mexico. I assume that there's oil there. There's always a real reason. Um, but after he left, I, um, I vowed not to cut my hair until we were out. It was a huge money saving for me. I didn't have to get a haircut until 71. Well, I want to thank you for being here, Travis. Um, you've added so much. We're going to have a discussion later with you and your colleagues on the Oracle. And my, my belief is that young people, when they see this in the future, uh, will feel a little bit better about taking action when they see things that need to be changed and know there may be just one person's thought and belief and taking that first step is how you get from here to there. And I want to thank you sure. for being here. Thanks for having me.